All right, so this is a continuation on of Unit 7. The very first videos you looked at were about memory and its part of this unit. Here are the learning outcomes. Have a look at them. All right, so we're going to start looking at thinking and concepts. Cognition is our idea of thinking. It's getting information in, forming ideas, being able to get it out. That's why memory is part of this unit. Now, our concepts are our basic ideas of things. When we look at something, we fit them into a concept or we think of, of something. We have concepts, you know, of birds, for example. You know, they fly, they got feathers, they have a certain shape. Our prototype, though, is our best example of those concepts. So if we look at a bird, for example, and I'll ask you, name a bird. You know, think of a bird in your head right now. Most of the time, you're going to think of robin, sparrow, blue jay, etc. Birdie birds, okay? But very rarely do you get people saying turkey or um, ostrich or penguin because they don't really fit our concept of a bird. So those prototypes are our best examples. Creativity is the idea of coming up with novel solutions to, to ideas that we may have. Now, convergent thinking is the idea we, we get, come up with these uh, ways to solve problems and we narrow them down into just one way to serve, solve that problem. And that's how we think. We think about it in one way. Divergent thinking is expanding that kind of thinking into novel ways of thinking and coming up with multiple solutions that may be outside the norm and this is often how we come up with, you know, really unique and good ideas. Creativity is led by divergent thinking. So Sternberg has these five components of creativity. Expertise, imaginative thinking schools, thinking skills, venturesome personality, intrinsic motivation, creative environment. Expertise, how much you know about a, a subject helps you. Imaginative thinking skills, obviously that is a component of creativity. Ventures and personalities, these are people that you know, are willing to go beyond the norm and do things that are adventurous that they may not be comfortable with. Intrinsic motivated, people that are intrinsically motivated as we looked at in the last unit or the last video. Um, are getting their inspiration from within. So it's exciting and it's, and it's uh, very motivating for them. The environment they're in can make a difference too. When you're in a creative environment as opposed to a stifling environment, you're likely to be much more creative. And creative people tend to favor those environments that lead to creativity. So if you want to boost your creativity, and we'll do some uh, creativity tests in class to see just how creative you are. Um, you need to develop your expertise on the subject you want to be creative about. You need to allow time. Allow time for let thoughts sink in and allow time you know, to absorb them and be able to bounce them around in your head. Um, experience other cultures and ways of thinking. Other cultures already have creative ways of dealing with things that perhaps we are not used to in our own cultures. So solving problems and making decisions is a huge part of our thinking. So how do we solve them? How do we come up with strategies? We can use algorithms. Algorithms are step by step. A computer uses an algorithm. For example, we program something in or ask it something. It looks at every possible solution that there is okay, and comes up with the best one. Um, this would be akin to you going to a grocery store searching for mustard and you go using an algorithm, you'd look at the start and you'd look at every single item in the store and then decide where the mustard was and you would be absolutely correct, but it would take a long time. And that is the disadvantage of algorithms, despite them being very accurate. Or you might use a heuristic. Heuristics are general rules of thumb that we use. So in a grocery store, for example, uh, we would say we're looking for mustard and is a condiment. So we're going to go straight to the condiment section and we're going to definitely decrease the time it took to solve that problem. The problem with heuristics is often they can lead you astray and not be accurate, whereas the algorithm is always accurate. Insight, you know, like insight learning that we looked at in the last video too, insight is that sudden realization to a problem. And we may come up with that often. Sometimes when we sleep on things and we combine our knowledge of sleep, you know, we'll solve that problem overnight. And we woke up, wake up in the morning, we have an insightful solution to it. Animals exhibit insight too, and we'll talk about that in class. Confirmation bias is the idea that we really like our beliefs. And we're going to find evidence that confirms our belief, and we're going to disconfirm evidence that, or ignore evidence that does not confirm our belief. Now, confirmation bias came up early on in this 
in the, our course, we were talking about research design and the reasons for psychological science. So you might want to review that. Mental set, you know, the idea that uh, we can become fixated. We can look at uh, how we've solved the problem one way, and then we have another problem that maybe we think is similar. So we're tend to going to go back to the idea of how we solved that previous problem. And that is a mental set. It may not be the most accurate way to solve it, but that's where we go. When we've been successful in the past, we tend to use that in the future, even though it may not be the best way. Try this. We got six matches. Okay, I'm going to get you to pause the video and see if you can come up with an idea. How can you put these into four equilateral triangles? Okay, pause it because the next thing you're going to see the solution. So here's the solution. Did you come up with it? Um, this is a, a three dimensional shape. Most of you are probably thinking two dimensional, okay, because we have a mental set and we can't, we don't think beyond of of those other ideas you know we need to be creative to come up with the solution if you got it good for you here's another one we got a set of matches some thumbtacks and a candle your job is to mount the candle onto a bulletin board you can't just put a tack in the in the candle in the bulletin board because that won't work okay pause and when you think you got the solution see what it is okay so here's the solution we could empty that matchbook or matchbox and we could state or uh, pin it thumbtack it to the bulletin board and then put the candle inside it and that's a novel solution and you may have come up with other ones but uh, it may take you in a while and it's like these are just easy things those of you that did solve it may come up with an insightful learning and go oh yeah aha that's how i can do it so our intuition is our automatic unreasoned feelings and thoughts. Okay, we, we basically go by the seat of our pants. We use intuition for a lot of things. However, intuition can actually be based on a lot of our past experience and we just tend to put it together very quickly. This picture down here, they're sexing chicks. Um, that sounded really bad, but they're determining the sex of these chickens, little chickens. And they can almost look at them and determine it because they've had so much experience with it that their intuition is is pretty accurate okay um with our heuristics there's two kinds that can help us and lead us astray a representative heuristic is that we think of the prototype and the likelihood of something fits into this idea that we have this general rule of thumb so if i ask you about there's a, a truck driver or sorry i start that over um there's a person and he's a short bald man he wears glasses he likes poetry um is he more likely a ivy league professor or a truck driver well he kind of fits our representative heuristic of an ivy league professor so we might guess that but if we look at the math behind this we go there's not that many ivy league professors to begin with and there's only about half of them are short about half of the, those that are bald but half of those that wear glasses we get a very small number but if we look at truck drivers it's such a huge base to begin with and then we whittle it down and we use the same idea half of them are short half of them are bald or half of them are bald and half of those are short and half of those like poetry which is probably even high um you're going to find that, you know, if, if we look at Ivy League professor, it's like one in 150, as opposed to a truck driver, it's like one in 25,000 or 100,000. Um, our best answer would have been the truck driver, but it fits our representative heuristic of an Ivy League professor. Other things, the availability heuristic is what sticks out in our mind. When people were... Um, after 9-11, when the Twin Towers in New York were knocked down, people were afraid of flying. However, it was probably the safest time to fly. Um, you know, like, uh, people were very diligent about looking for weird things, and there was tests, and there was, and the, and the act had been carried out. Probably very safe right after that, but people didn't fly because they were afraid, because that's what they thought of when they flew. If you look at, you know, these accidents and the way people die, the causes of death, and, you know, terrorist attacks stick out in our mind. But yet it's only about one in 100,000 deaths that that occurs with. You know, when we look at suicide, it, it's only one in 9,000 deaths. Auto accidents are far more dangerous. And yet the availability is sick when we ask, you know, what is more dangerous? Um, you're going to go to those things that really stick out in your head. Overconfidence, again, from back in that first unit or second unit, 
is the idea that we tend to think that we know more than we do. Okay, so um, we may look at a problem and we may be overconfident how to solve it and not look at what other people do. We may not understand the whole situation, but we think that we know more than we do, just like we looked at back in the start. How we frame things, this is another example from our research unit. Um, our belief per perseverance is the idea, once we have a belief, it's really hard to change it. So those people, uh, if you're afraid of flying, we can look at all the statistics and let you know you're 100 times more likely to die on the way to the airport than you are in the airplane, and it is the safest mode of transportation there is bar none. Um, you're still going to be afraid of flying because it's really difficult to get rid of that belief once we start. Which also leads us, you know, when you set a first impression on someone, they form a belief about you, so it's hard to change. So first impressions are important. Framing is how we word things. Um, the example we used in the past was, you know, would you buy hot dogs that are advertised as 75% lean or would you buy them as advertised as 25% fat? Same thing, only it changes our thinking and reasoning about them. Okay, intuition is huge, you know, our gut feelings, and it's usually, it is adaptive because we do draw on experience from it. And we can um, make good decisions through intuition, but often it leads us astray, which is important to understand when we have big decisions, you know, we can use our intuition, but let's back it up, you know, by looking, you know, through an algorithm or looking at, you know, pros and cons and that kind of thing. So let's look at thinking and language. Language, of course, you know what it is, it's how we communicate. It could be through sign or it could be through spoken word. The structure of languages, in all languages, based on phonemes, which are sounds. And in English, we have about 40 phonemes. It's all the letters of the alphabet, uh, which is more than 26, because we have different sounds for both the, each letter. Plus, we combine some, ch, ch, and th, th. Okay, those are all phonemes. We have about 40. Out of those 40 phonemes, we create morphemes, which are the smallest units that give meaning. So small root words and prefixes and suffixes count. So like re has a meaning. It means to do over. Or ed, ed has a meaning. It means in the past. Grammar is our rules that we use in how we put our language together. Semantics is, means meaning, just like semantic memory means meaning by memory. Syntax is the order we put things together. So for example, in English, we would say, the house is white. In French, we would say, maison blanc, house white. Same in Spanish, we say, casa blanca. Okay, so house white. Their syntax is different than our syntax as far as the rules of our language goes. How we develop it is, you know, we started at obviously an early age where we go through babbling. Then we go through a one word stage, a two word stage, and then telegraphic speech, which is basically eliminating all characters of our speech that we don't need or words. Okay, so the way it works is at about four months, infants will babble. It doesn't matter what culture you're from, uh, Japanese, Korean, South African, uh, South American, doesn't matter. All babies babble the same. You cannot tell what language you're going to speak from how they babble. At about 10 months, it starts to resemble the actual language. It sounds like they're talking, they're following the rules of speech, but there, there is no communication whatsoever. Then at about one year is where we say our first word. Do you remember your first word? I bet you don't, but somebody might have told you what it was. Okay, and then by two years, we get two-word speech or telegraphic speech. Okay, and the, the, a telegraph is something we used to send by Morse code before, you know, it was expensive to communicate overseas, where you would go to the telegraph office, give them their message, and they would send it through Morse code to wherever you're sending it to, and then they would actually translate it and deliver it. So using um, telegraphic speech, they would charge by the words and the sentences. So we would eliminate all unnecessary words. So telegraphic speech for a child is instead of saying, um, mother dear, I would love to sit in our luxury automobile and head to um, wherever and go for a ride. Okay, instead they would just say, mummy, go car, which translates their meaning. Okay, and then at about two years, it develops into complete sentences and then we combine them together. So 
at those young ages, we really develop a lot of language and learn a lot of words. Noam Chomsky came up with this idea of a language acquisition device, which says genetically kicks in at a certain time. And it's a part of your brain that its goal is just to soak up language, understand things, be able to determine. So it can determine you know, differences in languages, differences in words, and be able to just soak them up and you memorize them. And this is universal grammar. Okay. Um, also, it leads to these critical periods where when you are young, it's the best time to learn language. When you learn languages later in life, they're not stored the same, they're not used the same, they're not recalled the same. Okay, so if you don't learn a language before about the age of seven, you're going to have a lot of difficulty learning any languages properly. And that is the idea of a critical period. That time, period of time where it's important we are exposed to things or it never works the same way. If we look at our brain, this is review from our neuroscience unit. Broca's area and Veronix area. Broca's area again controls our motor movements for speech. Veronix is about how we understand it. Okay, so make sure you remember those. So how does language influence our thought? Uh, Benjamin Worf had the idea of linguistic determinism, saying if we don't, if we learn language, that determines how we think. Okay, and it makes sense. You know, if I tell you to uh, the difference between green and blue, you know, easy for you to think about. But if I tell you all to think about blue, um, many of you are going to think of navy blue, some powder blue, some royal blue, and so on. There's a big difference. But if I tell you to think about powder blue, you're all going to have a much easier way of thinking what I'm talking about. Same thing when I'm thinking about it, if I have language for it, it's easier to determine. Um, the Hopi Indians have no past um, verb tense, so they have difficulty thinking about things in the past. And that's an example how Worf says our, our language helps us think. So our language is influenced in thinking, obviously. You know, you think most of the times when you're asked to think about something that it is, you think in words. Sometimes you think in pictures, though, you know, when it's procedural and we think, you know, think about riding a bike. How do you ride a bike? You're probably going to think in pictures, but almost, you know, most other things you're going to think in language. So the better the language, the better our thinking. OK, which leads us to believe that why you should know your vocabulary, especially for psychology AP. OK, so we're, that's the end of Unit 7. We'll see you guys in class. Goodbye for now.